Thanks very much, Griff, for the kind introduction, and I thank you for your warm hospitality. I don't get this opportunity very often, so I think we should all note a very interesting development this morning that has just occurred. When Griff was introducing people, he introduced all the legislators and asked them to stand, and you notice they got a pretty good hand. Then he, had, he mentioned that Norris Smith over here to my left, Bill Shipp, Michael Hinkleman, and some members of the press were present. Did you notice not a one of them got a hand? <laughs> now, to, to Bill and Michael and Norris and the rest of you from the press here, y'all ought to take note. That, that means something, what I'm not sure. I would like to share with you for just a few minutes some thoughts about what I do. Why is that relevant to you? Because what I deal with on a daily basis are the sorts of things that impact upon y'all as citizens, as business people, as parents, you name it. I started thinking about this formulation of subjects or ideas about six months ago when I attended my 30th class reunion at West Point. One of my classmates asked me, Mike, what do you do? He said, I know you're the attorney general and a lawyer, but what do you do? And it got me to thinking, what sorts of things do I spend my time on? And I say it within the broad context of serving in the capacity as your attorney general where our main job is to try to make sure that government itself obeys the law and does so in an open, honest, and decent fashion. That's sort of our mission. But within that mission, there are three or four subjects that continually come up in my work and in the work of those people with whom I work. And they're subjects that reach right out and touch every one of us. I don't have the answers, but you ought to know about these subjects, and I want to share with you what little I know about them. One is crime, which has all of a sudden become the topic of the day. The second one is race. The third one is homosexual rights, and the fourth one is misconduct in government. Those four things I spend virtually all of my time on. Let me tell you a little bit about them from my perspective. Crime is the issue, in my judgment, that we have got to deal with on a number one priority basis in the short run. There's just no substitute. Government has as its primary obligation to protect person and property. If you take away that obligation, there's no reason really for government to exist. And as difficult it is, as it is for some people to say and understand, that function of protecting person and property outranks education, health care, and all else. Without it, there's no reason for government to exist. It's the ability of society to protect person and property that allows the weak to be protected from the strong. And we have failed. Make no mistake about it, we have failed. I attended a luncheon not long ago. Many of you were there. Senator Sam Nunn spoke. He spoke on this same subject of crime, which sort of surprised me given his expertise. His lead sentence was this, the American culture is in danger. And I think that is at least fair to say. When you look at crime, though, I would suggest you look at it on two separate levels. In the broadest sense, crime is a moral problem. We are failing to deal with crime because we're producing too many people who commit criminal acts. Why is that? Nobody knows the answer. There's no magic bullet. I suspect it is because of a breakdown and failure in the family. I suspect it is because we are not inculcating our young people with the morality that is necessary for a civilized people to exist. I'm not talking about any particular group's morality now. I'm just talking about that very essential morality. You might call it the middle of the road, which basically says nothing more than treat your neighbor as you want to be treated. And in that, we are failing. Government will not solve that. It must be solved in the home, in the church, 
in the communities, civic clubs, you name it. But what government can deal with is this second level of the crime problem. And that is we have failed in our mission to protect the public, to hold the streets, to keep our homes safe, our persons secure. That's not near as big a problem as solving why people commit criminal acts. We can do something about that if we have the will, and we have not shown the will recently. Number one, we've got to recognize the problem. Number two, we must have the discipline to deal with the problem. And three, we've got to pay the price. Let me give you some quick numbers. I've given them to this same group before, and they haven't changed dramatically. They're not going to change until we have the will to deal with them. Right this minute, we've got over 28,000 people in state penitentiaries. That doesn't include anybody that's in a county jail. That does not include anybody who is incarcerated as a young person in one of our youth development centers or those kinds of facilities. Over 28,000 people. Very important to look at the demographics, if you will, of that population. Contrary to what you hear, we do not put bad check artists. We do not put petty thieves. We do not put pickpockets in state penitentiaries. 80%, listen to this very carefully, 80% have committed one of six crimes. And I just checked this myself for the population as it existed on the 21st of February of this year. 81% have committed murder, serious assault on another, robbery, burglary, rape or child molestation, or sold dope. 81%, one of those six crimes. No petty criminals. What else do I know about them? As an anecdote, most of them have used dope in some way in relation to the commission of their crimes. That's interesting to note, but it's not dispositive, I think, of anything necessarily. Most of those people are there as a result of second or third offenses. The most startling statistic is this. The majority will be turned loose within one year. They're going back on the streets and they're going to do this over and over and over again and have been doing so for years. This is not a new phenomenon. <clears throat> the only good development that's occurred has been that first one, recognition of the problem. All of a sudden it's become very politically popular for everybody to get on the bandwagon about crime. And this is what I'm telling you today is probably better than it's been in 15 years. This has been going on forever. Lack of will. We can take the streets back if we want to. Now, you will hear this also. You will hear, well, we can't afford the cost. The truth is we cannot afford to do otherwise. But the cost is minimal if you look at it carefully. If you take every dime in the state budget, and I have personally counted this as recently as the current fiscal year's budget, every dime we spend on criminal justice is 10 percent. That's all. Every dime that is spent at every level of government, less than 3 percent. That city, county, state, and federal government, less than 3 percent. How can you say we can't afford it? Why is this so important other than protecting ourselves, protecting our property and our loved ones? There is a, a far bigger danger in all this than the individual criminal victim, as tragic as that can be. Somebody is going to come along if we don't get this thing fixed and say, I'm going to solve your problems, I'm going to make the streets safe, I'm going to make the trains run on time. And all you have to do is give up your liberties. And do not think for one second that it can't happen here. That's the biggest short-range problem. Let's talk about the biggest long-range problem. And again, this is just my view. And I, I recognize that reasonable people can disagree. The biggest long-range problem that we have to deal with as a state and nation is race. Why is that? Part of it stems from the fact that we are a multiracial nation. We cannot exist black and white 
or along any other such artificial lines. We're stuck with each other, for better or worse. I think for better. We must get along. We're not doing as well as we ought to. In some ways, I sense worse race relations than in many years. And I grew up here in Georgia. I've seen segregation. I've seen the, the depravity of segregation. I have seen the civil rights era, and I'm a little more worried today than I have been in a long time. What's happening, I believe, is that we are engaged in a debate trying to resolve a fundamental question about the racial issue. Are we a nation of individuals or are we a nation of groups? It's a tough question. If we are a nation of groups, then it matters very much to you what is my religion, skin color, language, creed, who my father was, who my mother was, and all other such criteria because you're going to judge me on my group membership. If on the other hand, as I think we ought to be, a nation of individuals, what's going to count is my character, how hard I work, and what I contribute. Vastly different ways of looking at society. And we're engaged in that debate. That debate manifests itself in all sorts of ways. In debates over how we select judges, in debates over how we draw congressional lines, and we really can't decide which one of these two we are. We've got the Justice Department telling us, you've got to act like you're a nation of groups. We've got the federal courts now saying, since Shaw versus Reno in 93, that you must act like you're individuals. And as the state's lawyer, I don't know what to tell the state to do, except litigate. And that's, that's the truth. We can't resolve that. Well. What, what are some other manifestations of this? One of, the, one of the most dramatic manifestations of the issue of race in Georgia in a long time is the state flag. Two years ago, I doubt there were many people in Georgia that knew or cared that we had a state flag. Today, it has become a cause celebrate. It infects the Olympics, you name it. I want to tell you my own personal view, just to be square with y'all. I think we ought to change the state flag, and I'll tell you why. This is very personal. I have been a military commander in the reserves for many, many years. I have had black GIs come into my office and sit in front of my desk wearing the same uniform I have on, and I know they bleed the same blood I do, and they love this country just as much as I do, and I can read body language, and I can read distress as they look at the flag. And I'm not going to do that. That's not what a commander is supposed to do. I, I, I find that offensive. Now, let me tell you something else. That flag there is my heritage as much as it's many of yours. I am the great-grandson of a Confederate veteran, Elijah Franklin Bolton. And it isn't all bad. But the answer to this dilemma was told me one day by my barber. And I've shared this with some of y'all. <laughs> my, my barber is really a bright individual. His name is Wendell Whitmore. And I, I've sort of made a semi-celebrity of him. Wendell is an Alabama redneck of the first water. He probably didn't finish high school, but boy, is he smart. He uses two names. He charges $8 for a haircut, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Not, nothing elaborate. This is what Wendell told me one Friday. I was getting a haircut for reserve duty, and he said, Mike, I'm going to tell you the answer to the flag problem, and you can use it and be governor. I said, well, Wendell, I, I'm not going to run for governor, but I want to hear this. He said, he said, here's the answer. We ought to change the flag because it's the Christian thing to do. That is a profound philosophic statement, and I'm, I'm being very serious. For those of us who are of that faith, that is a profound statement. But he said it won't work. He said it won't work until we look on the other side 
and look at some of the things that are just as offensive there. He said, how can you justify Miss Black America? How can you justify Black History Week? We don't have a White History Week. Well, I don't know the answer to all of that, but he raised a pretty profound question in my mind. We cannot exist as separate peoples. It won't work, y'all. Now, if we give up this idea that we're a nation of individuals and go back, as we did in my boyhood, to counting criteria such as race, color, creed, gender, and national origin, we're in trouble. We may not survive that. Check out Bosnia, South Africa, and all over the world, and you'll see what happens when they divide up on the basis of groups. This is a unique country. It does not depend on blood. It doesn't depend on language. It doesn't depend on skin color. It depends on a commitment of the heart and a construct of the mind. And that's what being an American is. That's our biggest long-range problem, though. Three, <clears throat> if I haven't made you mad yet, get ready. <laughs> the, third, the third issue that I deal with is homosexual rights. It's one of the toughest issues with which I have to deal, and it is the one that I least like to deal with. A very controversial issue. What is really at issue? This is my construction. I think the real issue is twofold. Number one, will those people who have a homosexual orientation be accorded special legal rights? Number one. And number two, ultimately, we will have to answer this question. Should people of the same sex be permitted to marry in the same sense that men and women marry? That's, that's what we gotta face. I personally think that the answer may depend on how you define the issue. I do not believe this is a civil rights issue. I think it ultimately comes down to how society wishes to define itself. I think society does have the authority to define itself according to its collective morality, within bounds, not totally. I mean, we don't permit bigamy, we don't permit incest, even among consenting adults. We do not permit bestiality, and many other things that are nothing more than our reflections of our morality and they show up in our laws. I think I'm like most people on this issue. Don't bother me with it. Don't throw it in my face. Leave me alone. You, you mind your privacy and let me mind mine. But don't teach it to my kids as a viable alternative lifestyle. And I'll be very frank with you. If you're gonna to try to teach it to Matthew and Zachary, my two grandchildren, grandsons, we will have a fight. We will fight till hell has a record hard freeze, and that's a promise. Now, that issue is not going away. It is distorted in its presentation. We need to deal with it up front and decide on it on the basis not of emotion, but just deal with it on fact. And the question, I think, the best I can formulate them are the two I gave you. Should homosexuals be accorded special rights? And two, should they be permitted to marry? Or should they be permitted a relationship which the law defers to and recognizes the same as marriage? Fourth issue that I deal with, and it comes up all the time, it goes to the very heart of our ability to have representative government and democracy. It's misconduct in government. Let me tell you up front, most people in government are honest, decent, hardworking people. Overwhelmingly so. Met very few who aren't. One, one of the traps we fall into is equating disagreement with misconduct. There are people who I truly disagree with. But I don't have to think of them as being engaged in misconduct. Having said that, though, I, I concede to you we have too much misconduct in government. You don't have to be reminded of the signs, and it's, it's not a partisan thing. I mean, all political parties have got plenty of misconduct. Trouble with misconduct 
even in small doses, particularly when you have things that aren't going well, like the criminal justice system, is that it erodes the confidence in government that's necessary for democracy to function. And we're just about there. The average citizen, in a word, is hot. They're mad because government doesn't work. We don't protect. We don't educate. We don't do anything very well. Furthermore, so many people think that those of us who are in government are there for our own personal benefit or the benefit of our friends and that our only objective is to get reelected. There is some of that. In the main, that is not what motivates most people in government. Having dealt with this for close to 20 years, I've about made this conclusion. There's no magic bullet for it. The only final solution is at the polling place, but we can't ask too much of our people. We've got to make it so that our people can vote easy, so that they can participate without undue distraction from all the other activities in life. And one distraction is checking on us in government. And they just don't have the time to do it. You don't have the time to check on every elected official for whom you can vote. You can't do it, no matter how good the media coverage is. So what's the answer? Again, no magic bullet. This is what's going to happen. We're going to have term limits. And it's going to come about as a reform measure. And the reform is going to be drastic. The reform is going to take this tack. Let's just run everybody off periodically. Just run them. Seriously, let's just run them all off. You're going to get the good and the bad run off, but you're going to get a new crowd. It will not make government perfect. It'll make it different. But that's what's going to happen. And I think that may be the only answer. The only answer that, that we can practically put in place. I can tell you this. If, if we don't do something to restore confidence in government, and if we don't deal with some of these issues like crime and race, public is going to totally lose confidence. And that's a dangerous thing. It's dangerous because as bad as our system is, it is the best system going. We can't give it up. I have an obligation to pass it on to Matthew and Zachary, at least as good as I got it. And so do you. And I'm confident we can do that. But we've got to deal with these things and deal with them quickly. I have enjoyed being with y'all. If there's a minute or two, Griff, is there time for questions? Okay. I'll take your questions. Fire away. <laughs> questions? Yes, sir. Speak to Bill Ship and give him that again. <laughs> I see him furiously writing, and I want to make sure he gets that down word for word. <laughs> yes, sir. You seem to have a pretty good handle on definition of government, health care. How do you see, in your mind, on a personal opinion, that government should function so far as health care is concerned? I don't know enough to speak much on health care, but let me, let me just tell you something that worries the hell out of me. I have seen what government has done with that health care with which it has dealt, namely Medicaid and Medicare, and I've seen Medicaid firsthand, and Medicaid truly is privatization gone amok. It's, but it's privatization with, it, with all the bad of the private sector and the bad of the government. And any time you tell me you're going to put government to running something, particularly something that deals with the intimate details of my life like health care, it worries the dickens out of me. Yes, ma'am. Yes.
on a national television program called Death Penalty. Right. And you said um, that in the state of Georgia, we bend over backwards to do anything to allow mitigating evidence um, that we, we go to an extreme so as not to um, have the death penalty set. I found myself confused given the fact that I was in, in Florida. Which case was it? You recall? Which one? Paul County, Stephen Anthony Mulder. Judge Story was presiding okay. as the case for uh, Andy Hall was the DA, the original. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so your question is? Well, my question is, how does the state of Georgia bend over backwards to, elect, to go to any length to avoid the death penalty being awarded as a sentence when in this case, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health had okay. refused to The state bends over backwards to allow anything in mitigation not to avoid the death penalty, but to permit a fair and full trial on the merits. We don't try to avoid it. I mean, that's the law of this state. We do so primarily by virtue of the fact that in a death penalty case, the defendant is allowed to put anything in evidence. You throw the rules of evidence out the window for the defendant only and allow that defendant to put anything in evidence which he or she thinks is appropriate. Moreover, not because of the state's acquiescence, but because the system doesn't work, it takes us on average 10 to 12 years to, to carry these cases from trial either to an execution or till they're thrown out. And during that time, they're continually in court. Now, I think that is abhorrent because it is depriving justice to the people, but more specifically to the victims of the crime, because every time you have a rehearing, a relook at these cases, and I've talked to many victims about this, they've got to relive it. But there is no question, I mean, I'll, I'll be glad to meet with you anytime you want and show you all of the things that we do to make sure that we don't get the wrong person or deprive someone of their rights. I, that's the last thing in the world I'd want to do, but. But let me tell you this, the death penalty is like all other things, particularly in the criminal justice system, but in government in general. If you don't have the will to carry it out, you do not have the will to govern yourself. And we, right now, are sort of teetering as to whether we have the will. Why do I say that? It takes 10 to 16 years to ca carry out these cases. The reason is simple. If I took a vote in here, everybody would say, or a great many of you, vast majority would say, I want the death penalty. But I, and then the second question, you would say, I don't want you to get the wrong person or make a mistake. And you put those two things together, those two views, and it means taking forever to get them resolved. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't want you to talk to Ship. I want you to call him a mother. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate all that you said this morning. However, I think it's the equal law. Equal law. You take a child who is accused, proven he did not do it, steal some lousy uh, ice cream. Which we were willing to pay for. But instead, they give that black child three years in jail. Then you allow someone to get up and steal from every American citizen in this country through savings and loans, and you pat him on the back and say, go do some community work. Something's wrong. I agree. Something's might. I agree. And that's a rock that we need to get rid of. I fully agree. You cannot do it as long as the courts remain all white. And you could not do it if all the courts remained all black. This is a country, and I agree with what you said about the flag. This is the flag that I went through, swallowing human waste, died. It's not like John Wayne did. And we must understand that. When you go overseas and fight for this country, when you come back, all you want to say is, she might have a little older. She might walk a little funny. She might not have the best clothes. 
But this is my woman, and I will straighten her up. And that's what we must do as a nation. We must work together to straighten this woman up. Thank God you. bless America, and I agree with you. <laughs> what else? Yes, sir. Prisons are not a solution to the crime problem if you define the crime problem as too many people acting aberrantly. Prisons are a solution, partially at least, if you say the first order of business is to get rid of people on the streets who are killing, maiming, and robbing. And let's take the streets back. Right now, based on the latest numbers I've seen, and these are not my numbers, I get them from the Department of Corrections. They're unrefined, unfiltered, I think. We released 17,000 people in 1991, 17,000 people in 1992, and 14 or so thousand people in 1993. The average time in prison for which was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 percent, 30 percent of their sons. So obviously if you increase the number of prison beds, through new construction or funding prisons that are built but not operating, you could increase that percentage of time that they spend in prison. There's no question about it. What do you need to do? Talk to these representatives. Talk to the governor. Talk to all these people in politics who have some control over the budget and tell them, look, let's stop spending money on slush funds. Let's stop spending money on pork. Let's spend money on the number one obligation of government. I mean, I will guarantee you to a moral certainty whether Atlanta will be a great international city will depend a hell of a lot more on whether we have safe streets than whether the Atlanta Falcons, whom we subsidize with a dome stadium, have successful seasons. I will guarantee you that. Paris is an international city, and they do not have an NFL team. <laughs> That's what you need to do. Yes, sir. It does. There's no question about that. I favor term limits. I, I acknowledge that it has a restrictive effect. I do not think it is that big a restricted effect. But he, here's the best argument I can think of for term limits. If you look at all the legislatures, our state legislature and the federal, the Congress, what do they value above all things? Seniority. So it means that a small district by keeping the same person in office for a long period of time without term limits gains enormous power irrespective of what the electorate in general thinks. And that's, to me, that's more of a deprivation of liberty than telling me I can't vote for somebody but twice. I mean, look, right now, uh, I could come up with all sort of flippant remarks about names that would be the best arguments in the world for term limits, but you can think of them as well as I can. What else? I'm not doing it because of the press is all here. What else? Yes, sir. Federal money to build state prisons without 
Let me take the third one first. No, I don't think they are. G getting money for prisons is a matter of local politics, local in the sense of state politics, and it depends on the, the vision, the direction that those in power in state politics, and I'm talking primarily of governor and, a, and legislative leaders, what kind of view they have. As to your first and second questions, the Board of Pardons and Parole consists of five people. I know them, they're decent people. The great mistake they made is saying, we will solve and handle the prison crisis for you. This didn't occur recently. This occurred 15 or 18 years ago. They volunteered to, to keep the governors and legislators from having to face up to the problem that we had a crime wave by doing what they're authorized to do, which is turn people loose. But that's not what they're designed to do. They are not designed to be the latch key for the prison system. They're designed to mete out mercy by taking on this political responsibility to avoid it falling on the legislature and the governors, they did us a disservice. This happened some years ago because they masked the problem. If they hadn't have done that, we would have had to face up to the problem 10 or 15 years ago, whenever it was, and said, look, we got a, we got a crisis in this state, and it was happening all over the country. If you abolish the Board of Pardons and Paroles, it's not gonna solve anything right now Superior Court judges can't do the job any better. The only way you're going to get the problem solved is one of two things. Stop sending so many people to jail or keep the ones that you send in jail by building more space. Nothing else you can do. Abolishing the board won't help one iota because if you abolish that board and let this prison population just build and build and build and build, the federal courts will take us over. And they'll do the same thing the Board of Pardon and Parole has been doing. The truth, though, you could abolish them except for their mercy function and just let a computer decide who gets out to control space. Yes, you could do that. But the answer is build space. And that's part of that, that third criteria I mentioned that we've got to have to deal with a problem, which is willingness to pay. We've got to belly up and pay. Tom? To set the record straight, we have <coughs> built six yes, new prisons. Yes, that's correct. They will all be open by July. They will be functioning by July. That provides us with 10,000 new prison beds. We have provided now in the legislature for truth and sentencing so that when somebody gets five years, they serve five years. The early release program was stopped January a year ago and the curve on the amount of time served versus the time that they get out has substantially reversed so that we're in the process of resolving a lot of the problems which you have addressed here and what we need to do is have the aggressive nature to go forward and fund these things and that's where we're coming from. To, to further set the record straight Tom, we, have, we did not stop early releases in 1993 no matter what anybody says. The, the, the figures that I got from the Department of Corrections show that on the average, prisoners released in 1993 serve somewhere around 30% of their sentences. And that's early release. I don't care what you call it. And they release 14,000 people. But what Tom is talking about is true. We are addressing the problem. The question is, we're going to have enough will to continue to address it, because this is not a one-time deal. We may have to build 20,000 more spaces to put some meaning into the system. And that's willpower. One more question, right here in front. Mike, is there a role in your office can play in enabling a public initiative? No. The only thing, the only role I can play is in terms of using my office as a bully pulpit to speak on behalf of it. I think we need public initiative. I can name you several problems in Georgia that will never be addressed, more than likely, unless we have public initiative. And one of them is reducing the number of counties. We need 159 counties like I need another hole in the head. It will never be addressed, absent public initiative. The reason is, structurally, the system is such that we have too many people dependent in politics on having 159 counties, we're not going to get rid of it. Yes, we need public initiative. 
Again, I've enjoyed being with y'all. Y'all have a very, very nice day. Thank you.